Man, we are so close to the end of this. All that's left is our funky cyberpunk material. Uh, the problem is, I don't know anything about shaders. I have brute forced my way through making this whole thing. Mostly by googling people that are doing something similar and then trying to hack together enough to make it work. So I'll go through what I've done and how I got there. But before we do that, let's look at what our material does. So we get this cool tiling. We can slap it on anything and it kind of just works. You will see that my ramp here looks a bit weird, but that's okay. I was able to tile stuff so that you get a nice runway going up. Nice shape going up. It's got a thicker line at the top and then we've got some down the side just to sort of make it obvious where the, where the ground stops and the ramp begins. Because that can actually be quite hard to decipher with this color scheme. All these bright neon colors, it's a bit of a struggle. How this works is all through a single material that then has a bunch of parameters that you can play with. So if we take one of our walls here, let's take this back wall. We'll focus on it, we'll rotate around with middle mouse. Here's our wall. We can grab it and slide it away from my level so that it's up here. This is all you see, it's just a wall. This is a CSG box, we've got a material on it. This is a shader material instead of the spatial material we've been using everywhere in our test scene. So a shader material is created from shader code. We'll ignore the fact that it's a visual shader, I guess, for now, and just focus on the shader parameters. So these are parameters that I've exposed that let us control how it looks. We can adjust our color to be whatever we would like. We can adjust our the number of tiles we show across the x-axis, so horizontally, and across the y-axis. So we can make them more densely packed if that's what we want. And we have an emission multiplier, which if you scale it right up, you start to get a lot of bloom. I find that really hard to look at. If you set it to zero, it looks really boring because it's just flat colors. And if you go negative, you get the inverse colors. It's kind of weird. So set it to a nice number before it starts to glow insanely. I think I had it set to two. And that's all there is. This single material is obviously shared by all of my walls there. But then these bits, say the floor, is the same material. It's just a duplicate so that it can have different shader parameters. So if we grab our floor here, we have our material. You can make unique which doesn't help too much with the floor, but if we pick one of our walls, say this one up in the sky here, we can say make unique, and now I can go into this shader parameter and change the color for just that one wall, or I can have it use the same material like it was before so that I only have to update one wall and all the walls in the level will line up. So that's set up nice and simple. I guess we'll dive into the shader. So if we were to create a new one, in our problem scene here, we would grab, say, our floor, give it a more useful name. We will create a new shader material, not a spatial, shader. Click through onto it. It has no shader by default. We need to create one. You can either use a new shader, which lets you write in shader code. That is complete magic. You could go to the shader toy website, grab some of their stuff. There is a page in the docs that tell you how to convert regular shaders into Godot shaders and you could try and create stuff. I I should learn it at some point but it seems like wizardry. A new visual shader is something I'm a bit more familiar with. This is exactly like our spatial material right? I feel a bit more comfortable with this because this is a PBR material a lot like what Blender does as well. So we have our albedo, which we know is a color, we could stick a color variable in. Let's stick in a constant. And now we can change our color to be something different. Lo and behold, our floor is now pinkish purple. These colors look a bit funny because we haven't set up a world environment and we haven't added any lighting. So we have our default world, which has that very blue sky. So everything is gonna have a bluish tinge which is why these things look sort of blue gray when in reality they're actually set to have a white color by default. Something else that we could do if we want to get the glow going is we could take our color here, drop it into our emission, and now we're a glowing pink floor. 
And if we want to ramp this up even further, we could take our glowing color and we could do some math on it, I suppose, a multiply. So we can take our nice pink color, multiply it by a much larger number and stick that into our emission. What's that give us? It's glowing so bright that it is white, but you can see in its bloom, it's a little halo of pink. Anyway, if we have a look back at our test map, we can look at the actual shader material we're interested in. And there's a whole heap of stuff. So let's start with the super handy thing that's built into Godot. You can click a little eye here and it will show you what's going to be coming out on any node we can see what the result of that node is outputting. So we're going to use this to figure out how on earth we're creating this grid thing. We'll ignore some bits for now. Like I was showing before, we can plug stuff into an emission. We can use a vector operation to multiply it to make it even brighter. Uniforms are the names for parameters. So my scalar uniform here called emission multiplier is this shader parameter here. I can adjust the value of this and it's updating the scalar uniform in my shader code. Similarly, my color here is this color. So we can see that we're doing exactly what I did in my little example before. We have a color of some sort. We are multiplying it by an amount and plugging that into the emission. If I pull that out, we no longer glow. We're just the simple color. So the real trick to this is getting this grid, right? We've already seen our output, so working from left to right, we start off with our UV input node, which if you right click under input, somewhere in here we have UV, UV and UV2, which are vectors, UV is the one that you want. This ranges from 0 to 1 across the x-axis going left to right, and 0 to 1 across y going from top to bottom. If we break this out into its individual components, we can look at x goes from 0 on the left over to 1 on the right, y goes from 0 at the top, 1 at the bottom, and there is no z component, so we can ignore that. So the first thing we want to do is sort our scaling out. If I change these numbers to be nice easy things to begin with, one by one, we'll see that our tiling x here is 1, multiplying this, we get 0 to 1 along the x-axis. If I change this to 2, we need to close this and open it to re-render, you will see that here we go 0 to 1 across the whole thing. Now we're going 0 to 1 in the first half, and then we're actually going from 1 to 2 in this next half. You just can't see it because we render 1 or above as white. We're then doing the exact same thing in the y direction, so 0 to 1, if we change this number, redraw, we go 0 to 1, then 1 to 2. If we then compose these back into a vector, we get a picture that looks a lot like our UV input, but everything's crushed in closer, right? This 1, 1 point here is now in the middle because we've got 2, 2 down here. We can then take out our fraction of the vector. So we're ranging from 0 to 1 and everything in between, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, until we get to 1, and then 1.1, 1 1.2, blah, 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 up to 2, right? So if we take just the fractional part, 0 0.123, and then again, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, yada, yada, so we get our tiling. So we now have two squares. We go from 0 to 1, and then 0 to 1, and the same going down. So this is how we're setting things up, to have multiple squares. If we change these numbers, we can re-render, and now we'll have five squares across, five squares down. They don't have to be the same. We have five squares across, one square down. So that's how we're handling all of our tiling stuff. We're taking a single input that ranges from zero to one, and we'll tile it however much we need. Let's go back to ones, because that's our simplest way of looking at this. We'll close these ones down, because hopefully we understand the tiling bit now. So now that we have zero to one, possibly repeatedly. We need some way of figuring out the top and bottom lines and then the side lines so that we can make a square. 
Now, this may not be the best way of doing this, but I've used this step operation. So if we have a look, uh, x is 0 up to 1. So step is basically the same as less than in this case, right? So if it is less than 0.95, it'll be a 1. And then there's just this little wee strip on the end here that is greater than 0.95. So the last 0.05 is in black. And then here we have the opposite. So we're taking everything less than 0.05, which just gives us a thin band down the left-hand side. There's a one minus function, which just takes one minus whatever the output of this is. So one minus one for these white ones is gonna be zero, so it'll be black. And then this tiny strip down here is gonna be one minus zero, so it'll be white. So if we have a look at this, here's how we get our left line and then our right line. Then if we add those two together, we have a line down the left side of our UV and one down the right side of our UV, and that's it. Then we do the exact same thing on the y-axis here. So zero down to one. We can take just a black strip at the bottom and everything else is white. And then that goes through the one minus and gives us our strip along the bottom. And then here we're taking anything below 0.05. So just the strip at the top, add them together. We get our top and bottom lines. Then we can add those together to give us our square. And so because we've already sorted our tiling, if we adjust these numbers to say three by three, re-render this, here's our new square, three by three grid. We can then take our color, which is our uniform here, and multiply it by either zero being black, so it'll continue to be black, or one being white, so it'll be exactly what this color is. One times whatever this color is, it's gonna be that color. And that's how we're setting our color on our square. So we can adjust our color wherever we want. Also re-render, there we go. Then we plug this into our albedo, which sets our color. So our squares here are gonna be black and green. And then the last wee bit is to get the glow, we need to plug something into our emission here. So we're gonna take this number, we're gonna multiply it by our emission multiplier here, and then we're gonna plug that into our emission. So if we hook that into our emission, we can set our emission multiplier to say five times. If we re-render this, this is five times brighter than this here. So that's all we're doing. We're setting the color and we're setting our emission value. Now you've got a cool cyberpunk material. And because it's just based on the UVs, most objects should just work with serious air quotes around just work there. When it's something like a plane, it's nice and easy because the UVs are just what you'd expect. You've got a zero, zero up here and one, one down here. And then we can just add our tiling multipliers and we're away laughing. So there's our first shader and we're doing it in visual shaders because it's kind of like Blender and therefore I can kind of understand it. So with that finished, I think you're up to date with where I'm at in this little project. Once I've edited these videos and chucked them up on YouTube, we're gonna add a bit more gameplay into our little puzzle game. If you've made it this far, congrats. That's a solid effort of listening to me drone along for hours on end. So thanks for tuning in and hopefully you'll come back for the next videos I make.